President Trump wants a sixth branch of the military, the Space Force. The president wants to create a sixth branch of the U.S. Armed Forces, a so-called Space Force. Immediately begin the process necessary to establish a Space Force as the sixth branch of the armed forces. That's a big statement. We may even have a Space Force develop another one. Space Force. We have the Air Force, we'll have the Space Force. We'll go with the Space Force. Think of that. Space Force. Space Force. Oh my word. This is going to be awesome. Space Force. Space Force. We need it. Space Force. Making space great again. I am so excited about Space Force. Actually, saying we need a space force is kind of like saying we need a new rocket force to deliver nukes. The idea is decades old, has been thoroughly explored and hasn't been seriously pursued for decades. Another objective dealt with the evaluation of AICBM damage and kill mechanisms. DOD needed an evaluation of the effectiveness of nuclear detonations at high altitude for killing incoming ICBMs. Yep, killing incoming nukes by nuking them in space is a very, very old idea. In fact, it's actually one of the more credible methods for stopping nukes. It would have some rather unfortunate consequences though. Like your army might actually have to learn how to read maps again. I mean, really, have you ever wondered why, if Space Force was such a great idea, why hasn't it existed till now, almost 50 years after men first walked on the moon? Let me explain. First of all, what is space? What do we mean when we say space? Well, space is really close. It's about two hours freeway driving straight up. It's up 100 or so miles or kilometers, that sort of thing, and you're in among the satellites. That's merely about the distance from New York to Philly. And beyond that, space is just big, really, really big. Even traveling at the speed of light, it'll take you over an hour to get out of the solar system. And thus far, the fastest humans have only gone one thirty thousandth of the speed of light. And even if you could keep that up, which you couldn't, it would take you over three years to leave the solar system. Now the problem is, once you get up there, you just fall straight back down to Earth again. This is the lowest energy way of getting into space. That's what Virgin Galactic is proposing to do with people. You just fire them up, they see space, then they fall back down again. If you want to stay in space, you need orbital velocity. And just so you know, the speed that the satellite is moving here, relative to how fast the Earth is spinning, is about correct. Low Earth orbit is about 7 kilometers per second, which is about 20 times the speed of sound. That's twice as fast as the state-of-the-art railgun bullets. Today, the U.S. Navy revealed a futuristic weapon that has been under secret development for years. David Martin has the first look at the electromagnetic railgun. The phrase, faster than a speeding bullet, just took on a whole new meaning. It can shoot a projectile like this well over 100 miles at Mach 7. Seven times the speed of sound. Seven times the speed of sound. This is why coming back from orbit without a capsule is fatal. We're already at 200,000 meters. You could thermalize at this altitude. I said higher. Drop the force field on my mark. Mark. The energy of anything at orbital velocity is a nightmare. I mean, imagine yourself as a bullet heading towards a solid object. Apart from it's not a regular bullet. The jet sets off, bolted to a track to prevent takeoff. It's doing 500 miles an hour. Okay, so you're getting this. This isn't even Mark 1. This isn't even one seventh the speed of the railgun bullet, or one twentieth of the speed of orbital velocity. 
and the only way that you can survive is by grazing the atmosphere slowly enough that you don't get turned into chunky salsa. A slug that big going Mach 7 puts a hole through six half inch steel plates this big. Just this little slug. Went through all of these? All six of those. There's not a thing in the sky that's going to survive against that. In this shot, what's officially called the hypervelocity projectile goes through three reinforced concrete walls. This also means that launch is also kind of dangerous too. That's a long elevator ride up. It's 330 some feet. Our getting into the spacecraft. Because it's basically a huge bomb that you're, you're riding up alongside. Five and a half million pounds of high explosives in the form of oxygen, hydrogen, and everything else. You have to accelerate yourself up to railgun type speed velocities safely. Ed White is flying at 17,000 miles per hour, 200 miles above the Earth. I mean, just, let's see what you need to shoot a bullet, a, a big bullet, a battleship gun. When the gun is in loading position, the gun captain opens the breech. Then the cradle and spanning tray can be tipped by a hydraulic cylinder to align with the bore of the gun. The rammer operator rams the projectile into the gun and the gun is ready for the powder bags. Now the powder trunk door is opened and three powder bags are rolled into the tray and three more bags are rolled into the tray. All six bags are now rammed slowly into the gun. That's right, six bags, each one about 18 inches long and 18 inches in diameter. This is the projectile and this is the propellant. And this is pretty much what rockets do. It's just without a barrel. And the dimensions tell it all. A rocket is almost entirely propellant. Which is why putting people into space is tough, because people are fragile. I mean, some ballpark numbers. I mean, let's say for sake of argument, people weigh about 100 kilos, 200 odd pounds, and they're made up entirely of water. Yeah, they're not, it's 70% water, but let's just say they're entirely water. So to vaporize someone is basically the energy to boil 100 kilos of water. And water takes about two megajoules per kilo to boil. So to vaporize someone takes about 200 megajoules, 0.2 gigajoules of energy. Now let's give that same person orbital velocity, seven kilometers per second. How much energy do they have? Well, energy is half mv squared. So that means that they've got about two gigajoules of energy, enough energy to vaporize them 10 times over. Or looked at another way, the energy density of TNT is about four gigajoules per ton. Which means that just your body has the same amount of energy as half a ton of TNT. That's about five times your body weight of TNT. Now let's just get a feel of what sort of energies can be fatal to humans. Well, the potential energy that you get from say jumping off a table is mass, that's 100 kilos, times the distance you fall, which is a meter, times by gravity, which is 10 meters per second squared. So just jumping off a table gives you about one kilojoule of energy, which you can probably absorb without too much trouble. However, you fall from 10 meters, that's merely 10 kilojoules, and that's not really so survivable. And sure, it matters what form that energy is delivered in and the period of time it's delivered in. I mean, falling from one meter, if you got a rope around your neck, is pretty fatal. And a handgun bullet has merely half the energy of jumping from a one meter table. It's about half a kilojoule of energy in a bullet, which can be pretty bad for your health if it hits you. But it gives you an appreciation of just how gentle you have to be when you're trying to give bodies orbital velocity, when you're trying to put two gigajoules of energy into a human. This is why space is hard. Now, while you're there, of course, it's not too bad, but putting the two gigajoules into them without killing them is hard. And taking those two gigajoules out of them without killing them is hard. And no, there's never gonna be a great revolution here. We've got the same rockets that we basically had a hundred-ish years ago. They're basically the same barely controlled explosion they were back then. 
As for the price of keeping people in space, well, let's just look at the International Space Station. It's a $200 billion platform. True, three to six. The idea that you're gonna station people in space to land them on Earth is just dumb on so many levels. In today's episode of the Infographic Show, we ask Space Force, what would it do? Well, at first it wouldn't be as glamorous as what you see in sci-fi movies, though given the rate of human technological advancement, it's only a matter of time before we take to the stars and war inevitably comes with us. Sorry, what? We went into space 60 years ago. The sheer cost and impracticality of getting there is why this will never happen. Number one platoon, EVA. Number one platoon. It's only a matter of time before we take to the stars and war inevitably comes with us. Responsibility for the US Space Force would be in the realm of logistics, where it would take a day or more to move even just a few pieces of military hardware from one place to the next by air, sea, or land. An orbital logistics hub could have that same hardware anywhere in the world in just a few hours. Except, no. Look, this is about the right proportions for the speed the Earth rotates and for a low Earth orbit. Low Earth orbit orbits the Earth about um, 10, 20 times a day, that sort of thing. Which means that you optimistically go somewhere near your target twice per day. That's every 12 hours. In terms of speed, it offers almost nothing over just loading up a plane and flying it there. Then, of course, there is the cost. While this is still currently outside the realm of our technology, it's not as far off as one might think. Yes, it absolutely is. Look, people have been making these wild claims about we'll have great space stations in just a few years' time. It's not as far off as you might think. They've been saying this sort of crap since Gagarin first went into space. The sheer impracticality of getting into space is why we've never developed a decent, cheap way of getting into space. And those problems are the same now as they were 70 years ago. While in the next few years, we might see orbital drops of hardware, such as food, ammunition, and medical supplies, it might not be long before American servicemen are themselves stationed in orbit and ready to deploy within a moment's notice. Bullshit! I mean, look, just the launch costs are on the order of $10,000 per kilo to get something to low Earth orbit. And that's the cutting edge, cheapest price type stuff. You know, you're looking at $2,000 for a lemon at this cost. The idea that this is going to be much cheaper in the future is bollocks. And the idea that you're suddenly going to get, or oh, any time close to now, an orbital supply depot doing orbital drops is just one of the dumbest ideas in history. While in the next few years, we might see orbital drops of hardware, such as food, ammunition, and medical supplies, it might not be long before American servicemen are themselves stationed in orbit and ready to deploy within a moment's notice. Yeah, just the cost for the person alone is gonna be about a million dollars. <laughs> That's not including a capsule to put them in. You know, space exploration and yep. um, just finding out what's out there, I guess. But NASA does space exploration. NASA is only gonna tell us what they want us to know. Whereas I think Trump will send his own stuff and we will find out the truth. Space Force! But why do we need Space Force? A uh, terrorist could, through the use of drones, get into space and become a very dangerous hazard to our freedom. ISIS could get to space. Space ISIS? Space ISIS. Right, Space ISIS. Battle of the Planets. G-Force, five incredible young people with superpowers. Who would lead Space Force? Neil Armstrong. Okay. I mean, he's dead, we'd have to bring him back.
Space Force. Thanks for that infographic show, which currently has just shy of half a million hits on YouTube. But it still makes the most viewed video on Space Force <laughs> seem like it's the work of a stable genius. This is the truth about Space Force. And it currently has a 90 something percent approval rating and about one and a half million hits. When it comes to defending America, it is not enough to merely have an American presence in space. We must have American dominance in space. But there's a lot of critics I've been noticing in the government who are extremely against this space force. And it's kind of made me wonder why there has long been for years now, and there's proof of a long-standing secret space program that is vastly more advanced than anything that we could imagine. Uh -huh. But for some strange reason, this evidence doesn't extend to anything beyond old footage of the Gemini and Apollo missions. Now, according to the Solar Warden theory, and what the evidence suggests is that there is a secret fleet of spaceships that keeps a permanent presence in our solar system and defends us against any would-be alien attacks. Others believe that the project is being used to colonize parts of the solar system, possibly of the so-called elite. Many whistleblowers over the years have also stated that whatever space tech or aircraft tech that we have today is nothing compared to what we really have and that our secret aircraft that the public do not know about yes that's right the government projects you don't know about are run much better than the ones that you do know about like for instance the f-35 lightning which was recently summed up as the new plane can't turn can't climb can't run photographs of unidentified flying objects that seem to have been snapped above the earth out in space as well as a secret list of quote off-world officers and in fact the presidency is actually you know much lower on the pole when it comes to these high security clearances there's many more that go above his head so it may be a matter of him simply not knowing about it but that's just my theory. Does he know something that we don't? And that requires a need, a very quick need to get this Space Force set up and running quick. Is there something out there in space that we need to be protected from? No, no. The calculations to show why we don't have large spaceships in space are really quite straightforward. This is why most of our satellites don't have people on them, because satellites deal with the vacuum and conditions of space much better than humans do. Now, satellites are primarily reconnaissance and communication devices, and of course, they've been up there for, for decades now. They're also exceptionally vulnerable. I mean, let's just take, say, for instance, high energy radiation. This is the thing, there aren't many intermediate altitude satellites. They're basically all confined to geostationary orbit, which is a long way up where they go around the Earth once per day, or skimming the Earth's orbit, hugging the atmosphere in low Earth orbit. And this is because the region in the middle is the Van Allen belt. Okay, there, there is actually a hole in the Van Allen belt so you can go in, but it's all basically a dance to avoid the radiation of the Van Allen belts. The Van Allen belts are a band of radiation trapped by the Earth's magnetic field, basically electrons and protons hammering back and forth between the North and South Pole at near relativistic speeds in the magnetic bottle of the Earth's magnetic field. If you loiter there too long as a human, the high energy particles start killing your cells and you die from radiation sickness. Loiter too long there as a satellite and you suffer the same fate. The high energy particles start smashing up your chips an atom or two at a time and sooner or later they just stop working. So to avoid the Van Allen belts you basically have to hug the Earth's atmosphere, that's low Earth orbit, or go above them to something like geostationary orbit. However, if someone detonates a nuke above the Earth's atmosphere, it doesn't really matter where. It massively increases the size and strength of those bands and the satellites start falling like flies. Hell, just with a test that the Americans did, they killed a bunch of satellites and they weren't even trying. While America had been making rapid strides in other aspects of missile technology, 
Its investigation of high-altitude nuclear detonation effects had lagged. Three small detonations, known as the Argus series, were launched and triggered aloft for the purpose of examining the Christophilus theory that a long-lived belt of trapped electrons could be artificially created by a very high-altitude nuclear explosion. Three effect shots, yucca, orange, and teak, were detonated at respectively 26, 43, 77 kilometers, primarily to provide information on the change of blast, nuclear, and thermal effects with increasing altitude. Another objective dealt with the evaluation of AICBM damage and kill mechanisms. DOD needed an evaluation of the effectiveness of nuclear detonations at high altitude for killing incoming ICBMs, vital to the nation's anti-ICBM effort. An ICBM, for those who didn't live through the Cold War, is an intercontinental ballistic missile. Basically, what you use to shoot nukes at other countries. This knowledge, in turn, would indicate the relative vulnerability of U.S. ICBM re-entry vehicles. The loss of signals due to disturbances in the ionosphere caused by high-altitude detonations. On Operation Fishbowl, nuclear detonations rent the sky five times over the Johnston Island area. Of the five fishbowl shots, the highest burst was the 400-kilometer starfish event launched by a pod-carrying Thor missile. Its yield was 1.4 megatons. In addition to the local phenomena, the transport of bomb debris and other charged particles in the magnetic field produced colorful aurora arcing into the northern and southern conjugate regions. Almost all conditions had returned to normal by H plus two hours, except on starfish, where effects were detectable Pacific-wide for two days. The communications problem resulting from multiple nuclear bursts would be serious, but adequate planning and technical sophistication should make it possible to maintain limited communications at all times. With America now of necessity peering skyward in its quest for security, the results gleaned from 1962's high-altitude operation contribute both to this safeguard role and to scientific enlightenment on the effects of the atom above the atmosphere. Hell. Just by a test, not really knowing what they were doing, a single nuke eventually ended up wiping out about six satellites. There's no defense against it. All you need to be able to do is fire a nuke upwards a few hundred miles. Or say option number two, just put a gun on a satellite. In fact, it doesn't even have to be a gun. It's kind of preposterous if you think about it. Bullets merely travel at the speed of sound. A satellite is already going 20 times that fast. Just drop a marble on a, on a collision course. In fact, if you're going in opposite directions, the marble is going to hit the other satellite at 40 times the speed of a bullet. Even a kid's playground toy will strike with the force of a railgun on steroids. <laughs> a velocity that would make a railgun seem like a pea shooter. Now, satellites, of course, can be somewhat radiation-hardened at the cost of making them heavier or less powerful as you get more robust chips. And, of course, that makes them more expensive, but they can't be made bulletproof, especially not against marbles fired at railgun-type velocities. In this sense, anyone who can launch a satellite starts off with a drawer full of superweapons. But let's just say you do that, and everyone smiles that you've happily knocked out all of the enemy's satellites with a handful of marbles. It's still an own goal, because for every satellite you destroy, you create lots of debris which then floats around in low Earth orbit. And again, railgun-type velocities. Explore, repeat. Expect the communication blackout at any moment. Copy that, Houston. This is Kowalski confirming visual contact with debris. Debris is from a BSE sat. Yes, the debris cascade of the Kessler syndrome would never be as dramatic as it was in gravity. But the underlying principle is correct. That if you get enough junk floating around in low Earth orbit, it becomes impossible to operate satellites there for any significant amount of time which means that very quickly you make low Earth orbit an exceptionally hostile environment for any satellite. When it comes to defending America, 
It is not enough to merely have an American presence in space. We must have American dominance in space. In this sense, it's a question of who's got more to lose. I mean, almost anyone can fire stuff up in space and blow it up, essentially poisoning the well for everyone else. It's a lowish tech venture and there's no possible defense against it. It's just a question of who's got more to lose. Now, remember what I was saying about space being really close, like 100 or so miles away? Well, here's a cool idea. Why not put nukes on a satellite so you can fire them down on the enemy with almost no warning? Well, again, an obvious idea with even greater shortcomings. What is Hercules? Hercules is an armed orbiting satellite. It's nuclear weaponry aimed toward outer space. Right name, wrong direction. There will be no change in the direction of our rockets until the Russians admit they've got their own rockets and until they also agree to realign them. Is that understood? What can Hercules do? It can send at the press of a button enough power to destroy any foreign body on a collision course with our planet. A satellite developed before the United States developed theirs. But which we designed and constructed for the purpose of defense against possible disasters such as the one confronting us now. Firstly, and most obviously, low Earth orbit is skimming the Earth's atmosphere. You don't go over your targets very often, twice per day, tops. Currently, nuclear missiles can hit anywhere on Earth in about half an hour. What's going on? Those are Miniman missiles. Like a test, sort of. Like a warning? They're on their way to Russia. They take about 30 minutes to reach their target. So do theirs, right? Roger, understand. Over 300 missiles inbound now. So it's really not that much of an advantage to put them on a satellite. Further, without the tiny boosts to make up for the atmospheric drag that you always get in low Earth orbit, you eventually just get pulled back into the atmosphere or a malfunctioning satellite would just fall back to Earth with all of your nukes on it. Yeah, not a lot of takers for having nukes in space. Or wait, why not put nukes into geostationary orbit? Well, again, the problem comes is that geostationary orbit is a long way up. It would take you longer to fire the missiles from geostationary orbit to Earth than it would to fire them from one place on Earth to any other place on Earth. So again, no advantages. Or what about lasers in space? Well, a cute idea until you realize just how big space is and the size and power of the laser you would need to do it. I mean, for a better idea on this, I did a whole video on dodging space lasers where I cover the divergence issue of the beam and the utterly insane amount of power you would need for such a laser. Here, an artist's projection of the president's vision. Hi kids, and welcome to the 80s, in the height of the Cold War and Space Force Mark 1.0, also called Star Wars, or the Strategic Defense Initiative. U.S. spy satellites would watch the world below, detect Soviet missiles blasting off, compute the position and speed of each missile, alert battle stations in space on Earth. Which is probably the only part of this which was ever Feasible. Space based kinetic energy weapons fire high speed projectiles from hypervelocity guns. <laughs> hypervelocity guns, which shoot bullets slower than orbital velocity. And with those dumb fire projectiles, you've got to hit a moving target hundreds to thousands of miles away. Firstly, you would never be able to shoot the gun accurately enough. Number two, you would never have a power source powerful enough to operate the weapon. And number three, even if you did, all that shooting in space would create loads of space debris which would trash the rest of your system. Earth-based nuclear-powered X-ray lasers fire their radioactive rays. Oh, the good old space-based X-ray laser which never really worked. Not entirely unsurprising as it required a nuclear explosion to power it. Attack rays from land-based Exomer lasers are redirected by huge mirrors orbiting in space. Ooh, 
using mirrors to reflect lasers. That's a good idea. You've just got to hope that the enemy don't realize that all they've got to do is coat their missiles with a really shiny reflective coating. Chemical lasers fire beams that burn through the shell of the onrushing missile. Okay, so deuterium fluoride lasers do work. They require the mixing of deuterium and a fluoride-based compound, which basically then combusts and produces this laser. Very expensive to run, a one-shot deal. Something entirely impractical to put into space, and even on land, it was mostly useless. Particle beam weapons with pulsing rays join the attack. Surviving warheads enter the atmosphere above the United States, are attacked by laser-equipped planes. Earth-based lasers and ABM rockets eliminate the last warheads. Yep, that was Space Force Mark 1.0. It spent billions of dollars and really didn't achieve that much. The whole system could have been trashed relatively easily due to the vulnerability of satellites or just overwhelmed by lots of decoys, or, or by really simple countermeasures, like just putting a reflective coating on your missiles. A child with a stick of chewing gum has just rendered your $100 million worth of hardware useless. Any suggestions? But what about kinetic impact? It's basically dropping rocks from space. Well, okay. <laughs> The idea has been extensively looked into. On paper, it's fine. Drop a telegraph pole-sized rod of tungsten from orbit and it hits Earth at about 10 times the speed of sound and about the same energy as 10 tons of TNT. Which sounds impressive until you realize the energy to put that lump into space in the first place. And of course, 10 tons. That's only the size of a large conventional bomb. Now, sure, it's got some advantages, like you can't really see them coming, but the cost is obscene. And again, in low Earth orbit, you don't go over your targets very often. And the cost. A shuttle launch costs about half a billion dollars and could only carry about 30 tons to low Earth orbit. That's only three of these rods. So they would cost about $100 million per piece. Yeah, they were called rods from God because he was the only one who could afford to put them into orbit. So it's not so much that Space Force is a great new idea, which America is lagging behind in. All of this was worked out decades ago. Worked out, investigated, and they decided that it wasn't very useful. Kind of like nukes, for instance. They're basically city killers, which in a modern economic resource-based warfare means that you can hobble a superpower with a dozen nukes. You could wipe out the largest 10 cities in America, which would decimate the population, one-tenth of the population gone. And a single large nuke over the middle of America would produce an EM pulse that would cripple America's power grid for the best part of a year. And of course, wipe out a large portion of its satellites. The fate that befell Stalingrad and Berlin over months could be meted out to cities by the dozen in less than an hour. However, the reason this never happened, of course, is because they could retaliate and do the same to you. They take about 30 minutes to reach their target. So do theirs, right? And this is ignoring the whole prospect of a nuclear winter, which would basically be an entire year without food, which would be a cruel shock indeed to a planet used to supermarkets full of food. As Sagan once described it, it's two sworn adversaries, one with three matches, the other with five, both standing up to their waists in gasoline. 
The danger, of course, being is if you have temperamental, scientifically illiterate leaders who don't understand that gasoline burns. I think that there'll be little change here. It'll go up, it'll get a little cooler, it'll get a little warmer like it always has for millions of years. I don't believe that what they say, I think it's a big scam for a lot of people to make a lot of money. You know, it's all lies by the liberal elite or fake news. But if it is forced to defend itself or its allies, we will have no choice but to totally destroy North Korea. You look at the operation of uh, this White House and uh, you have to say, let's hope to God we don't have a crisis. So that was Space Force Bastard. And if you enjoyed this video, I'd be grateful if you give it a thumbs up and hit subscribe and ring the bell. And of course, if you really want to support this channel, you can do it directly through Patreon. And I'll leave the links below.